show you like this. Um, this is this is the real background. <laughs> I should have known you were in the Manhattan <laughs> skyline. Yeah. As you, the... yeah. This is this is Peter Thiel's uh, uh, penthouse. In <laughs> they give you free access, I think, when you go through a fellowship, right? You just like yeah, you, you get the key. Yeah. Yeah, keep like, two years. <laughs> All right, it's been uh, more than two years for you, though. But like, I mean, yeah. you kept the, you got the, you you did well enough that you could get you could keep the key. Like, I just never I just never returned it. Like, it's, it's an <laughs> issue. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, <laughs> uh, recording, so I'll I'll kind of get started yeah. and we'll kick yep. it off in the next two minutes. Cool. We're alive. Exciting. Well, we're um. We're not going live, we're recording to YouTube and we'll post later. So it says it's live, but we're just recording. We'll get to the background discussion in the post edit. We'll uh, make sure that's. You guys are all on your uh, judging links, right? Yep. Cool. Actually, I can't, I can't answer that for everyone. It's not it's like that logician question. Like, uh, I assume though, Kartik, you did you did a good job going through it. So I feel like most likely. Actually, if you guys want to just quickly um, click on one of the stars for fuzzy ads, just to contest something on my end. Yep, I, I just clicked. Cool. Clicked. Yeah, worked for me. Great. Yeah, we're <laughs> um we have we have this whole custom setup and everything. It's pretty cool. I really like this actually. Yeah, like what did you use to build this? Uh, you don't want you don't want you don't want to know. You don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Some uh, jQuery and uh, no. Um, I mean, it turned out really well though. So even if it was a this was your hackathon project for the hackathon is what I'm gathering. Basically, yeah. Cool. Did you get that last message in the chat. You want us to turn everything off. Actually, panelists, you can leave your um, your cameras on. This is um, these are messages now to the attendees who will be promoted to panelists when they become uh, when they do their demos. All right, it's eighteen of them, eighteen in the room. Let's uh, kick this off. <clears throat> so, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today is our day two of Hackathon Judging. Uh, I'm Kartik. I'm one of the co-founders of Youth Global, and I want to welcome all of you um, on the recording, but also on, on the attendee list for our hackers to, uh, to our judging day. So um, as you know, um, we're going through this whole week of judging uh, for our hacker business projects, and uh, we're super excited to actually show what everybody's done today. And for those of you who are not familiar with HackFS, over the past month, uh, we had 470 hackers from 50 different countries and 19 across working across different 19 different time zones. I work towards making really interesting projects uh, that use the best of tools and uh, technologies available from the Ethereum and the Falcon ecosystem. And uh, they spent the last four weeks playing with what's possible, experimenting with these uh, technologies, and then showcasing and submitting a project that um, we'll be seeing over the course of uh, today and the rest of the week. And uh, through all that hard work, I'm super proud to announce that we have 132 uh, projects that have been submitted for this hackathon, and we're taking today to showcase you uh, a, a good chunk of these projects uh, and, and going through the judging uh, on, on this call. So before I kind of kick off the actual demos, I want to briefly walk into some of the logistics of how the event was set up and how judging itself is going to work. And uh, kind of the quick highlight here is that there's going to be 13 teams today that will be presenting to our judges, where each team is going to get four minutes for demoing what they built and uh, a four minute uh, time for Q&A from our uh, judges. And to minimize any AV issues, we've uh, asked all of our teams to pre-record their demos so everything you'll be seeing today will be a video that's going to be played uh, with, but the Q&A itself will be live with the teams. Uh, a quick overview how, of how the event itself was set up. Uh, every project you're gonna see was uh, either worked individually or with a team. Uh, if somebody was working with a team, uh, they could have up to five members in total. And as a requirement, uh, all code that you're 
that they had to build and, and submit for this event uh, should have been written at the over the the window of the hackathon itself. So everything we're going to see today was done over the past month, and uh, the only requirement for these projects to qualify for this event was that they must incorporate. Uh, the tools and technologies, whether it's uh, SDKs from our sponsors or the uh, the baseline protocols that enable uh, uh, these two ecosystems to exist from the Filecoin and uh, the, the Ethereum ecosystem uh, should be used for any good project. So a lot of cool things we're going to see today are a unique mix of uh, the best of what decentralized storage and smart contracts can do. And we're super excited to see what everybody's done. In terms of how the judging is itself going to work, uh, we have five categories here for our judges to rank every project on. And uh, these categories are going to be on how technical, original, practical a project is, along with how easy it is to use uh, in terms of the design and the developer experience for it, if it's a developer tool. And we also have a general category we call the raw factor to do a catch-all for something that we might have missed uh, in the four categories above. And uh, before I move on to our demos, I want to emphasize that this is not a competition. Uh, these events are purely here for hackers to learn uh, what is possible with uh, the tools that are available for the decentralized web. Uh, and the hackers are here to share their excitement uh, for what they've uh, built and, uh, and learned over the past month. And the judges are here to give feedback to these teams and, and just to kind of really nail that down. Not everybody here is trying to become a business. We really want this thing to be a place for everybody to experiment and learn. So everything you're going to see is very much done and presented from the filter of this is a creativity aspect of it and not the business applications of what this can be immediately after this event ends. So a quick schedule on how judging is going to go. We have these 13 teams that are going to be presenting today and doing the hard job uh, for the next two hours are our three judges. So I want to welcome Scott Moore from Gitcoin, Dietrich from Protocol Labs and Aaron from Textile. Uh, they'll be here with us uh, walking through all 13 demos and uh, with that, I want to call up our very first team, Fuzzy Ads, to come on and uh, kick off with their demo. So with that, let's uh, kick off day two, uh, demo number one. Introducing the Fuzzy Network, a decentralized ad network. By being decentralized, the Fuzzy Network can function with less middlemen. Less middlemen means more profit for us and for the publisher. The profit comes from removing many third parties. Unlike traditional networks, we don't record user data. We don't need to. Traditional networks need this data to target ads. We'll use an algorithm to analyze the website's data and traffic to figure out which ad to show. Publishers and advertisers can also trust our data. The project is open source and the data is recorded to the blockchain. Uh, moving over to the advertiser side of things, um, I'll just run through the steps that you need to uh, use the platform. Uh, the first would be to buy a one day slot from OpenSea. And the second would be to upload slash edit the information uh, for the ad that you want to display in the slot that you bought. Um, to buy an ad, you would go here. Um, this is really just a list of uh, the running auctions on OpenSea. Um, if you want to buy a slot, you'd click here and you'd be redirected to the auction on OpenSea. Um, I'm not going to demo this process since I feel like it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, once you've bought a slot, you would go here to visit, um, basically get a list of the slots that you own. And this is how you would, um, edit the information for the ad that you want to show uh, within that slot. And so here, uh, this was, th those were just two slots that I had already set up. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to say change the image that you're displaying um, that, that is being displayed by the publishers in this network, uh, this is where you do that. Um, and so you'd update the form and then submit the changes. Uh, what happened here is that um, basically you would edit information that's being held in a smart contract. And the smart contract is what the SDK is drawing from. And so this would update uh, what the publishers are showing. Now, uh, we did not get to setting up uh, you know, tracking views and um, as well as the payment channels. Um, but basically, this is what we envisioned uh, you'd be able to use um, to see the results of past advertisements. Um, moving on to the publisher side, um, really there is only one step and that was to embed the SDK. Um, I'll leave this up to Elijah to talk about a little bit more. Uh, what we have here is a link to uh, the SDK, which is hosted on GitHub um, and shows the steps that you need to take as a publisher. And then again, although we did not get to setting up the payment channels uh, in history, we, we would imagine this page being uh, basically showing a record of 
uh, the payments that you've received as a publisher on this now? Um, so imagine you're a publisher and this is your site. It doesn't have a ton of stuff on it right now, but you want to make some money. Uh, so what you'll do is you'll add into the head a script, uh, which you'll pull in from Pinata, Pinata's IPFS gateway. This fuzzy ads SDK should now enable uh, you to pull in, to use this web component called fuzzy ad, through which you, you would pass in uh, an ad unit ID, which helps us identify the specific ad slot that you've created or that you've minted on, um, on, on, on our platform. Um, and that ad slot will serve the right image to display to the user who has landed on your site, which is right now the, the Filecoin um, Ignite banner. If we click on it, it should take us to the Filecoin homepage, at which point through a, a, a payment gateway, the payment from the advertiser will go directly to the, uh, to the publisher for having a user having clicked on that site. And through this process, we've been able to cut out any middlemen um, who are siphoning data from the user and from the publisher and uh, return all of that value um, to the publisher uh, instead. And so yeah, this is, this is Fuzzy Ads. Thanks for watching. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, you guys, uh, judges, you guys can jump right into Q and A. Everybody, thanks, thanks for the demo. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a question. I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Are we jumping? I, uh, in? No, I, go ahead. I had a, yeah, I had a question at the very beginning. Uh, you said that there's an algorithm to analyze site traffic to be able to determine value. Can you explain that algorithm a little more? Sure. Yeah, uh, that's one thing that we we envision creating that in the future. But it, it kind of is uh, very important to us that the user maintains uh, privacy. One of the big problems with the current networks is that all of the information that they use to place an ad is based on user information that the user didn't give them. They, they actually took it from them. So our thinking is that instead of using user information, like the user's buying history and their location and their demographics and all of that, we would kind of create a, an algorithm that would uh, uh, scrape uh, website information and analyze the information. So contextually, it would know what the website was about. And then we could couple that with uh, information about the traffic that the website uh, gets, which we could also grab uh, and kind of create our own scoring system in that way. So just to clarify, the traffic information is derived from the loading of the ads themselves. No, the so, traffic information, well, it could, we could use that information to supplement, but I, I think we can also get traffic information in other ways. Okay, so out of band, you get information about the website and its volume, okay. Yeah, just to add to that, um, uh, there's, there's explicit information about the ad and the advertiser. Um, so uh, the, the geographic, the information, the geographic information about the advertiser would be uh, given to us through 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 the platform, um, and then from the scraping of the website, you'd have some some uh, some some uh, grouping or some sort of clustering of where uh, where in this like high dimensional space that that website belongs in relationship to other websites, uh, and the and the distance between the relationship between the the ad itself and the information about the ad would be placed in 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 that context in the same kind of high dimensional space. Uh, to help determine the, the the relationship or the closeness between the advertiser and the ad and the actual website, um, and that that would also yeah. contribute to the score. Cool, nice. Um, I I heard quickly in the video you guys are using Pinata to store some JavaScript assets. Uh, load. Are you? Are there any other kind of like underlying platforms? Or tools that you're using that we should be aware of. Yeah, um, one of them that we were thinking of, hope, like hopefully getting to using, was was Threads, ThreadDB, um, to to help us store uh, the actual traffic information um, as well. 
is your is your question more kind of in context of like how would you store the SDK or no, just just more just like technically what tools are you using to to build this thing? Gotcha. Just quickly, just quickly, there's and, about uh, 40, 45 seconds. Just yeah, I'm not sure. If this can just be appended to that question, but like the smart contract component in particular, like how are you leveraging that in the context of the revenue generation and distribution? Like, just I, I'm not sure if you can capture all that in the one question, but. Right. Uh, we didn't get to setting up the payments channel part, but I just want to note that we're also using IPFS to store the metadata for the ad. So the the IPFS link is being stored in the contract, and then that's what the SDK is drawing from when it pulls up an ad. Cool. Um, unfortunately, I got to cut you guys off, but thanks so much for the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks, guys. Awesome. So the next team up is a ballast. Um, if you guys are ready, you can... Uh, Share your video. Hi, HackFS. I'm Alec. I'm Zach. We're Akashic Technologies, and our project is called Ballast, which is a software slash firmware slash really any arbitrary binary data distribution system that acts as a secure notary. And effectively, we're using the Ethereum blockchain as a source of truth for the latest software releases that a company can use. If they wanted to store it, in a decentralized store rather than hosting it on their own server. Hi, HackFS. Using that, we can actually, in the future, file coin networks. Don't know what happened there, sorry. So we're effectively using Ballast Core as the bridge between the Ethereum blockchain as well as the IPFS and of in the future Filecoin networks. And we're also using Next.js as a REST relay and a web UI front end. Using that, we can actually bridge back to traditional systems via the HTTP relay or directly to your Web3 provider using the web UI. And eventually we will have a CLI that will support CI/CD pipelines. We used uh, an Open Zeppelin's access control libraries in order to establish the different access control features. But effectively, one is able to create an organization, create repositories under that organization, and publish software releases to those repositories. And then clients can subscribe to those repositories to get the latest release. So to check out the API, we can actually go to a URL that looks like this. This is the organization slug. This is the repository slug. And using this, we could fetch the latest metadata and it will return to you the IPFS hash or the Filecoin SID that you stored in the future. And if you go to slash latest on the repository, then you can see the latest release hash that they have published. And in the future, we will actually implement tags, uh, filters. It is almost implemented, but time constraints. And if you actually go to this, URI here on the IPFS gateway, for instance, you can actually see this is our Valis library published here. So if we wanted to actually upload another release here, we could do so. Upload it to Panada. Copy that hash. Use our good old SID converter. Copy that. And we could even do an npm install. So I'm going to switch my screen here, my terminal window, and do just that. And then using this, basically organizations can distribute their software on a decentralized repository and run their own relays that they can use then if they don't want to use our first party relay. And currently our API is actually hosted on Netlify. And since it's written in Next.js, all you need to do is run the relay yourself if you don't want to use our front end and plug in your own Web3 provider. And if you'd like, even your own IPFS node. So as you can see, it was able to successfully pull the NPM package and install it, which is great. And the NPM package allows you to actually tap directly into lib and talk to the smart contracts and IPFS and abstracts away many of the features. So thank you. 
All right, I'm just going to stop that there. Um, the couple things I wanted to note, um, just real quick, that original architecture is a little bit outdated. We are calling IPFS directly rather than going through PowerGate. Uh, and at the end, there I actually forgot to submit the transaction to publish a new release, which would then show up in the API. Um, we also deployed ipfs.valis.io to Fleek, so you can access the uh, IPFS-only version without the API that just talks to MetaMask and other uh, Web3 providers directly. Um, and eventually, we're going to implement a redirect to an IPFS gateway so that you don't have to manually enter the hash into a gateway yourself. That's kind of the idea. <laughs> I really like this idea, actually. Um, this is really cool. In terms of, uh, and this might be a bit too specific, we can dive into like more general questions too, but like the credentialing, how are you planning to, I guess, extend that right now? It's using Open Zeppelin. That might be, you know, a bit tough for enterprises. Like what's your sort of plan for that in the future? Yeah, definitely want to simplify the organization and repository management as much as possible. Uh, right now, we just basically, all you need to get started is a, an Ethereum address, um, and then you can create an organization yourself. You become the administrator of it. Um, the web UI, we're intending to abstract away all of that. Basically, all you would end up needing is Ethereum. Um, and then from there, you could create an organization, add other keys to the organization. We have different roles, organization level and repository level. Um, and then events for each of those levels as well. So you could subscribe specifically to a repository or specifically to an organization. Um, and it, we try to follow a similar namespace as like GitHub with organization or username slash repository and then fetch any of the latest data there. So the idea is if you're an IoT device, all you would need is a simple Web3 filter, subscribe to the repository that you need. And then next time you get an event, you can execute any auto update features. So. The kind of idea we had for this is that authentication is one of those things everyone redoes over and over again. So is auto updates and firmware releases. And they all tend to be hosted on centralized servers that could eventually go down anyway. So might as well kind of bridge that gap. Awesome. Just a quick note, we're two minutes left. Uh, thanks, sir, for the demo. I really appreciate the uh, attention paid to developer experience of being where developers are and how they work. Uh, one of the uh, questions that I had was around it, the, there, there seems like there's a hybrid topology here. I mean, some of that is around meeting developers where they are. Uh, one piece of feedback would be to include kind of the overall architecture diagram and kind of topology of the stack and where the components are. And I think that would make it easier to see the changes that you said at the end. You said the architecture has changed now and those changes are are interesting and I would like to learn more. A visual of that might tell a lot in a short period of time. Definitely, thank you. Yeah, we originally came up with that architecture in the beginning and then things kind of changed. So we'll, we'll definitely be updating that. Any, any last questions or things you guys want to highlight? It's about 15 seconds, I'm sorry, 30 seconds. I, I had a question about a, what were your thoughts from a developer adoption standpoint? Things like this exist, but it's really hard to get the mass movement of people to adopt it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's kind of why we went with the core lib piece to abstract away as much as possible so that uh, we, we've met with several people who actually have had this kind of use case necessary. Um, and we've seen this kind of thing need to exist a few times. So figure why not open source it and see where we could go with it? Sweet. Thanks so much, guys. Um, Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Uh, cool. All right. So the next project after Ballast is Eradanos. Eradanos, it's a Greek name. Um, verifiable credentials on ceramic. So it's uh, whenever you guys are ready, you can play your video. Uh, is there audio on this right now? Yes, there's audio to be to be there. We tested that. I tried this one. Wait a second. Start again. Okay. Hello, Matthew. 
to the little hide on this uh, demonstration, a project that we've been doing during the Hack of this hackathon in July 2020. What I would have to achieve this on um, building a custom prototype on the same protocol that allows for creating and verifying verifiable credentials and claims on Ceramic. Now some of the parts I'm going to show you work a little bit slowly. This is uh, due to Hackathon on this machine. And uh, right here we go. I already used that account before, which is just popping up on my iframe. Um, what, what, what we had to do to make this happen, because everything was in the browser, and we wanted not to store the feed in the browser, of course, we wanted to use a wallet. So, what we did in the first place is we created a free box and we are connected to the free box profile of the user. We created the private space called Rubanus, which is visible here actually. And in that space, we started the seed for the identity wallet that's now used by Ceramic because Ceramic cannot reuse the free identity wallet that comes uh, from Freebox because mm, as Ceramic class, this is the free ID, the ID from Freebox, which has an IP address and um, other DB, and Ceramic uses um, the new identity wallet. So the little achievement we got here is we are using Freebox to store the secret seed that we are using for the identity that's called Ceramic. But we have to do the only way we're able to achieve that. And uh, here we go. The first thing that's, that's really the important step is actually creating a custom uh, verified credential that to document on ceramic. Um, we tried to, uh, to make this as simple as possible to, to do actually. We, we only give the credential subject, what did you say? And uh, uh, so a, a, a person. So we will have to verify that this person, this person attended that hackathon, hackathon, and we're proving that to ourselves, which is, which is a little bit um, <laughs> useless or pointless, of course, because we know that we attended him, which we ended that. But um, um, the concept is actually quite interesting. So we uh, create this verifiable uh, verif uh, credential according to the W3C standard, and we're inlining a proof. We're not using a JAXL, which would be obvious if you use that dead uh, uh, RBC project. We're really using a JWS uh, in here, which is of course similar to a JAP, but this adheres to the standard uh, of inline proofs of verified credential documents. This is what we're especially proud of, that in our cloud, I'm uh, sorry, it's not our cloud, um, where in um, this test document, we're creating a little, the, the proof in line um, in the Genesis document, and uh, we have to actually to extend the um, identity wallet's free ID provider with the same JWS uh, method that we're calling, because this is not yet ready to allow, allow, it's not yet on the free ID provider. We're still waiting for the official implementation, but with this implementation, it's not working with that time. We will soon, uh, as, as we got this kind of document, um, there you go. Anybody can use the proof to uh, like, uh, verify the document. Just by putting it here. And this one is doing an inline proof of uh, the document if they verify the claim content. Looking at the whole ceramic, checking that the JWS has, this, uh, has a signature that matches the public key. Even just playing the public key here. And well, this is the first step I would say how the whole claims could work on the ceramic protocol. Thank you very much. Awesome. Um, just a quick note. So the audio was a bit jumbled, but I think we kind of got the general idea. I'm going to give you guys an extra like minute um, in the Q&A to help with any uh, translation issues there. So uh, yeah, you can uh, continue with Q&A. I, I saw the, the repo Phil, Phil did. Can you explain that what that particular component was? Well, this was uh, the first idea how, how to name the project, of course. Um, because uh, the, the first idea was to, um, to put uh, Filecoin support on Ceramic. But as it turns out, this is what the people do anyway. And this is why we didn't follow it up. And then we came up with a weird name, Eridanos, because, oh, there's a story behind it. It's, it's in the description. Greek mythology. I have a quick question. Or go ahead. 
I have a quick question. The main, sorry, the, the main yeah. point of the project is to demonstrate how verifiable uh, credentials can work on ceramic. And uh, maybe it didn't come out in the video that well, everything is just running in the browser. So ceramic is currently at the point of building a Node.js application to build that ceramic network, but we actually run the node in the browser. So we are losing some parts of functionality because I think the anchoring service is not running right. But uh, it's quite nice because now you can use them to, to do things like recoverability checks and everything, or you can even um, revoke uh, verifiable credentials from the issuer by themselves because you can prove that the new document is not what has been uh, proven in the first place. In the, um, in the document, you mentioned a few challenges that you ran into, just like, for, for example, like um, to like clone and build the forward code modules, like the remote system stuff, I guess I'm curious about, like, can you dive into a bit more about like, um, like how was, how did you resolve that challenge of making this work on like remote systems? Oh, you, you mean like cloning the repos on remote systems or do you mean like? Um... Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's quite quite funny. I mean, of course, you use Git submodules for that, and then you you bind everything together in your GitHub repo. But then we had to. Uh, we're using Fleek CO for hosting, and then you. Uh, I mean, Fleek has 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 to build all this stuff, and Fleek has to get all the dependencies. This is actually quite straightforward, but of course, you have to write all the build scripts. So and you and you you always have to pull all the upstream stuff because Ceramic is also proceeding at the same time. This, gave us some hard time because they also advanced quite a bit in that way that, that we are doing. For example, in the IDX protocol, this is what we're really excited about. But I think they're not really concentrating on the VC aspect of it. They're more concentrating on the schemas. And uh, yeah, we tried to, to take as, as much of them as we could, but uh, the, VC, the VC stuff is really unique to us, I guess. Quick note, we're at the eight minute mark, so you have your extra one minute now. Oops. Um, yeah, I mean, are there any other questions? Special ones. Because what was really hard was like binding. I mean, Ceramic is a, is a, is a three box project, right? So it comes from the makers of three box. And uh, now the three box people are moving over all the stuff to Ceramic, but this is not really compatible in, in that sense. So you cannot just use the identity of three box in Ceramic, even though it looks like that. So you could use the identity that's injected, but unfortunately Ceramic is not able to resolve that. This gave us quite a hard time. So this is why we're doing a little trick here. I explained that in the video in the beginning. Um, this is not supposed to go live at any time, but we're pretty proud that we're doing it that way. So it's completely decentralized in some sense. Yeah, I like that it nudged it a little bit closer by running running the node in the browser. It gives the, the end user and app developer a little more control. It's nice. Absolutely. Cool. Awesome. Well, um, your video is just aside. Um, great demo. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, cool. So the next group up is Cadbury. Um, I'm going to be playing the video for Cadbury. So I've seen bits of the video. The first minute is particularly interesting. Um, Cadbury is uh, open, neutral, borderless, decentralized, and censorship resistant uh, meetings. So it's kind of a video hack, and they have a video that demonstrates their video in the hack. So uh, I'll get it set up and then uh, start the timer. OK, everyone can see this. We're good. Let's go. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, Glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do.
Hi Ayush, what's up? So did you find it difficult to join the meeting? Hi Sushmit, no it was frictionless, very smooth. Right, right. So I'll explain you how this meeting is working. So basically what happened is that there is a signaling server that helps my browser to discover your browser. And when that event has happened, the WebRTC takes over. So all your video, audio and your data, that is your chat and the other artifacts get directly streamed to you. So it's browser to browser and it is handled by RTC Peer Connect and RTC Data Channel. I'll send you some chat here I use. And I will also try to send you one image too. So see how seamless it was. So basically what we are making is that uh, whenever four or more peer joins, a mesh network gets set up. And these are like every audio and audio are transferred to everyone. We have discovered that we need to come up with a protocol wherein these signaling servers, these FCUs and MCUs, all of these can be decentralized. Once we have this protocol, it can power everything. Like it can power meeting, it can power streaming, it can power OTT platform, and it can even power broadcasting platform. Amazing. And these, our protocol would be actually complementing the Lightbeer 2 and the Filecoin protocol itself. It's really amazing product demo. Can you also explain me the exact mechanics of how it works in the form of slides. Let's hand, go to slide then. Sure then. Bye. So I use VLC meeting mechanics here. Our front end is on React.js and internally uses raw client side WebRTC. We establish mesh network for all our connected peers. We have come up with our own custom signaling server that can be linked and deployed to Heroku in within a single click. Signaling server handle all of the IC and SDP candidate and gives control to WebRTC. The WebRTC then handles peer-to-peer -peer audio, video or data streaming via RTC peer connect or RTC data channel. We are hosted on IPFS via Fleek utilizing unstoppable domain. Our ratings are, are handled via Ethereum smart contracts and our meeting artifacts goes on the Filecoin via Textile Power Gate. So future work, we need performance, scalability and decentralization. So we need to come up with a protocol wherein we'll have these signaling servers, MCUs, SFUs, transcoders, orchestras as an actors complementing the Filecoin or the Libre protocols. Okay. Um, so yeah, open it up for Q and A. Uh, I go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm I'm super excited that the uh, signaling server is often the point that people put to the decentralized service and think about as the afterthought, the most centralized part. So the fact that you're picking up the signaling server, signaling server, and uh, leaning in hard on how to solve that problem and adding more decentralization, more value to it, maybe even standardizing that pattern, I, I think is exciting. Can you talk about what the <laughs> of of those remaining centralized parts, how how you how you look at, have you looked at ways that how to distribute or break apart the centralization aspect of signaling server that one point that connects those two pieces? Right. So hi guys, it's nice to meet you. All. So basically, we have looked into those feature. How do we decentralize a centralized component? So it was quite obvious. So if we see to scale up a meeting we need to uh, have a SFU that is selective forward unit or MCU to scale up the meetings and even the signaling server. So these are kind of central component. And if we we had looked into live P2P WebRTC also, so even live P2P is using some kind of signaling mechanism, right? So we do, we can take inspiration from LiPeer protocol. So what LiPeer does is that they have an orchestra and this orchestra is uh, directly responsible to handle the transcoders, right? So these transcoders are not protocol aware. So only these orchestras are protocol aware, right? So whatever our, suppose if we keep a, a mechanism, if we come with a protocol, wherein these orchestra would be responsible for the service and the availability of signaling servers and the MCUs or the SFCU. Now these orchestra can work parallelly with the orchestra of the live pair also. And this can also work with the uh, textile power gate also to like uh, all of the meeting data that is being generated can be stored for the further, uh, like a uh, kind of meeting uh, like YouTube for meeting that has already happened. So that can be picked up from those. So it's like kind of orchestra model. So the orchestra would be like protocol aware, but these signaling servers and all of these would not be protocol aware. 
right so but orchestra would have to stake within the protocol and he has to be responsible for the service and the availability of the all of the signaling server sfp and other services so this is the we are approaching and we are also looking for some suggestions also there's about a minute and a half two minutes left did you find um, working with the web rtc tools are, are they were they basically just exactly what you needed or, or did you find that there's any anything you need or want to change about that stack of technology in order to make it work better uh, in this like decentralized solution that you're talking about? WebRTC has played a very good role because it has from browser to browser. So this perfectly goes into our case. Now, uh, for signaling also, we are using kind of WebSockets internally. So we want to shift this architecture to the Live P2P WebRTC and Live P2P WebSockets too. So uh, regarding WebRTC, as of, I don't think we require any improvement. It handles pretty much good. So, That's great. And, yes. Cool. Can you, so you mentioned you're pursuing in some sense a similar model to live here. Like that's like one of your down the road sort of goals. Can you, I, I think you may have described this a bit, but I, I'm not sure I caught it. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Uh, sorry, I didn't get your question. Can you? Like, so for, for I didn't like, get your question. Yeah, like for, I, like how are you, I guess, addressing scalability? And like, it sounds like you're, you're pursuing that in a similar way to live here. Is that, is that correct? No, so we actually would be complementing LiveWare protocol. So if you see, LiveWare is actually designed for broadcasting protocol. So in our initial okay. approach, we wanted to build decentralized application on top of LiveWare protocol. So we actually contacted the co-founder, Eric, of the LiveWare. So he himself recommended WebRTC. So LiveWare is actually designed for one-to-many broadcasting system. So it has a bit of a lag. And meeting is kind of its dynamics, like it should be real-time. Even a two-second lag cannot, like, it's not up to the mark. So we had incorporated LiveWare protocol also. So the protocol that I'm discussing that would be uh, there, it should be like, it will be handling the SFQs and the signaling servers, but this can, this orchestra of the MCUs and SFU can directly talk to the orchestra of the LiveWare protocol. So all of the transporting mechanism can be pushed to that. Thanks. So we would, that's why I said it would be complementing LiveWare and complementing FileCam for the protocol. Awesome, that's helpful. I'm gonna to have to stop things there, but thanks so much guys for the demo. Thank you. It was nice meeting you all. Thanks guys. Awesome. So next up on the live stream, we have Libertas, um, censorship resistant decentralized social network. Uh, I'll let them take it away with their video and, uh, and then we'll do Q and A right after. Just quick check, is there meant to be audio or no audio? No, it's supposed to be audio. Okay, I'll give you I'll give you an extra couple seconds to kind of figure out the audio. Introducing Libertas, making your world unstoppable. Libertas is a decentralized censorship resistant social network that allows creators to create and share videos and articles, interact with their audiences via live streaming, and talk to anyone, anywhere via P2P calling. Libertas is powered by the community, and it brings decentralized governance in the hands of the creators. Here, they can vote for new proposals, take down videos, all by the community and for the community. Libertas brings a censorship resistance. The UI and its data is deployed and replicated across IPFS, Fleek, Pinata, and Textile, making it decentralized. It also makes the DNS decentralized, bringing in and deploying it on unstoppable domains. It is also accessible via Tor, making it privacy focused and truly unstoppable. Let's jump right into a demo. Right off the bat, as soon as we click this call, we see three options, videos, live streaming, articles, and calls. I'll talk about each one of them. First, we've got videos. 
Here we can see the videos that have been created by the creators on the platform. By clicking on any one of them, it will take you directly to the video page. Now this has been built in a way that there is no direct interaction of Web3 until and unless you have to fire a transaction. So as soon as you're watching the video, as soon as you hit play, there should be a transaction that fires that lets you have view the video. Now I've already watched this video, so it won't ask me to pay for that stream again. But what happens in the back end is as soon as I open another video that I haven't watched yet, it loads up that video from IPFS, creates an ad that has been sponsored by the video. As soon as I hit play, it fires a transaction via MetaMask to create a stream directly from the advertiser to the video creator or the content creator. And that stream is brokered by the Libertas contract. Now, here you can also view view the video you can see the number of views you can subscribe to the creator as soon as we hit play it fires the transaction in the back end and it creates a stream via meta transactions now the second thing let's talk about articles all the articles that have been created by the creators on the platform simply click on them and it gives you a full markdown experience where it fetches the article from ipfs and renders it completely without the need of any interaction with web3 so if I were to copy the link of the article and paste it in a non Web3 browser, it still works. You can also tip, uh, tip a content creator if you want. And similarly, you can view the entire article experience without the need for any interaction. So it gives you a seamless Web2 experience. Now, let's talk about live streaming. Live streaming setup is pretty simple. All you have to do is click live and you get a control panel wherein you can enter the title of your stream, enter the title, duration, the time period, whether it's paid or not, the rate at which you wanna earn, and simply hit update stream. What happens here is that it connects to a PeerJS node in the backend and gives you an ID. You can simply copy that ID and share it with anyone you wanna be allowed to join your live stream. Similarly, you can click on calling Calling works in a way wherein you can, in a simple fashion, wherein you can connect to a, obviously a peer in the network. And as soon as you connect it to the network, simply co copy it. And if I just open up another window again, so this would be another person that you want to talk to. I simply hit allow, give my permissions, copy my ID, hit call, accept my call, and boom be connected on both the sides. So this was Libertas, making your word unstoppable. Thank you. Well, nice video, guys. Um, like you mentioned, I'll give you an extra 30 seconds because of the audio thing. Um, so you got four minutes for Q&A. That was a, that was a, that was a, a fully featured uh, solution is really interesting. I, I can imagine there's a whole lot behind that. Can you talk a little bit about what the what 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 are there centralized components? You mentioned Peer JS in there. What were the challenges in in putting things like signaling servers or, or Peer JS or some of these other things onto places like okay. Fleek or possibly centralized? Sure thing. Uh, so the primary issues that I faced with Peer JS is that once you're actually developing on the platform, they give you a default service. So that they are the default standard service that actually create connections all around. So that was, that actually gave me a very um, disturbed connection, which wasn't really stable. So I had to set up my own standard servers on Heroku. So I have a couple of them running right now, which actually really connections all across all the network. So this actually helps me scale out the network also, because the live streaming part and the peer-to-peer -peer calling part is actually powered by the same WebRTC servers. So it allows me to actually connect to n number of people participating in a call for live streaming. But if there is a direct one person to one to one call, we can participate in as many people as you want, but they can also be one to one connections. And uh, similarly, uh, one of the things that I primarily wanted to do with Libertas was actually to have a seamless web experience but at the same time having the entire stack decentralized. So as uh, the storage here, the IPFS and the data itself are deployed over IPFS, they're replicated over Pinata, the data is stored in textiles. 
textile bucket. So we've got the entire storage there decentralized. We've got the DNS decentralized. So we've got again yeah, unstoppable domains. We've got it accessible through top also. So for people who actually want to publish a not constantly, so the entire network allows you to publish whether it may be videos or articles completely anonymously in a censorship resistant manner. So let's say even if you don't have ETH to publish a transaction on the blockchain, uh, I'm using by economy is better transaction infrastructure. So that you don't even have to worry about having ETH in their wallet and they have a biggest Anybody else have questions? I have another one if you don't. Sure. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. What I saw the, in your advertisement demo, uh, the advertisement was shown, but kind of without the user's consent. How does a system like this avoid the weaponization of advertising against uh, dissemination of information problem that we have today? Sure thing. Uh, so rather than actually having the advertisement show up uh, in a sort of an algorithmic fashion, we give creators the power to actually choose the advertisement. So if I was an advertiser and I want to show my advertisement on your video, I send a request with my entire ad. So as soon as I create an ad, each ad has a specific rate associated to it and a budget associated to it. All the data with that ad, the link, the entire information is sent to the content creator. Now it's up to the content creator whether or not they actually choose to show that ad in front of their video or beside their video. So what this allows us to do is that, let's say if I, as a content creator, decide to take Google as a sponsor and show their ad beside my video. Now, because that ad cannot be changed once published, I know exactly what is being shown beside my video. And rather than having the accountability with the entire platform, we give creators the power to actually monetize that content. So as soon as you click the video, a stream is created directly from the advertiser's account to the content creator's account using Xavier, so that uh, creates a, that streams money or it's a, at the rate at which the advertiser decides directly to the content creator or as long as the video is being watched. So as soon as you go away from the video, the stream stops and it sends a transaction behind to stop the transfers and creating the experience. And those components are built as well, right? You built that? Yes. Yes, you can actually go right now to the link and try it a lot. We may have time for one final quick question. Is there any um, concept of uh, discovering your social contacts, or have you do you have any thoughts about how to do that in the future? It's something I've always seen as a challenge when it comes to uh, decentralized social networks. So so the way that I try to do it was I have a smart contract, the, the main primary level the smart contract, and then there's another contract that the smart contract itself calls. So as soon as, as I, as a content creator, publish a video, the smart contract itself calls in uh, another contract which relays all the event handlers. So what this sort of does is that it uh, anonymizes the subscriptions. In a sense, if I am subscribed to a creator, People can't really see that I am subscribed because the event of subscription was actually fired by a different smart contract. So it actually uses the message sender problem to its advantage and uh, anonymizes where the actual transaction is coming from. So the discovery happens in a way is that if I am subscribed to five content creators, whenever those content creators create a video, that event is fired. So I'm able to correlate my address and my subscriptions and with the quality that that is fired by the uh, smart contract. So as soon as I know that another creator actually published a video or published an article, I can actually get a notification on my phone using EPNS or any other notification services. Um, I gotta end it there, but thanks so much, man, for the demo. Um, thanks a lot. Thanks for the good questions. Thank you. Thanks. Cool. Uh, so the next group up uh, is building um, wrapped Filecoin. So uh, this is actually one I'm kind of quite personally interested in seeing how this all works. Uh, it's something I wanted for a personal project. So yeah, wrapped Filecoin, let you guys uh, start it off.
Hi, we are Team Wrap FS. I'm uh, Nazareno. And I'm Christian. We worked on uh, Wrapped uh, Filecoin. We thought it was a great idea for such many applications in DeFi and would be cool to be seen uh, as a collateral MakerDAO or to be swapped on Uniswap to cite a few. For the first iteration, we opted for a custodial approach uh, where by leveraging on uh, textile PowerGate API, we created a custodial wallet on the backend and also we implemented an ERC-20 token deployed on Coven. Also, we uh, implemented a Filecoin wallet like uh, Metamask for, for Filecoin. Uh, so now, Christian, I'll show you a quick demo. Well, starting with our UI, we have this approach to our uh, simple wallet where we can create a new address. Right? We get the token, which is a, like the private key and the address. We can check balance, which in this case is going to be zero, right? And we can send file coins to any other wallet. Now we can check the balance of uh, another uh, account that we already have created before, where we have 0 0.995 Filecoins, right? Now we are gonna use our UI also to grab some of those uh, Filecoins into Rapid Filecoin, right? So here I can say that I can grab 0 0.01 Filecoin, right? The wallet that I'm gonna use to grab is the one that I've previously copied and the Ethereum address where I want to receive my Filecoins, my Rapid Filecoins, is this one. So when I hit Wrap, I gave, we gave the, the user the instructions to send those 0 0.01 Filecoins to our custodian wallet, right? Like this. So now we can head to the wallet and send the desired uh, Filecoin to that wallet. So we want to send to this wallet the amount 0 0.01 and the private token of our account, which is this one. Right? So when we hit send, we get a success message. Now we have to wait for the transaction to be confirmed. It's just uh, confirmed. We can see the transaction on, on Ethercan. So just to mention that the user interface has been deployed uh, on IPFS via Flick. And also we are leveraging on Lotus to talk to Filecoin testnet. Right, where well, now we have the 0 0.01 Rapid Filecoin minted. We can see on our MetaMask, we have already received those uh, 0 0.01. Okay, now we can take some of those Rapid Filecoins and unwrap it into Filecoins again. So in this case, we can say that we want to unwrap 0 0.02 Rapid Filecoins and the address then where we want to receive our Filecoins. Okay, so when I hit unwrap, this is gonna uh, say me that I have to connect with MetaMask, right? And it's connected. Now I can see in the transaction to unwrap those Filecoins. We wait for the transactions to be um, processed. And now it's processed. We can see also in, in on Etherscan. Now, and we have the, we get the, the success message. Now, if we check our balance and see that it, it went from 0 0.08 to 0 0.06. So now we have unwrapped our 0.02 Falcon and our balance has updated. Uh, thank you for watching. Nice YouTube recommendations at the end. Um, yes, yeah, so you got to get four minutes for Q and A. Yeah, I mean, definitely this is super necessary. What sort of are your next steps? Like the custodial piece obviously is one that comes to mind, but what else is sort of on your road? So yeah, for the next step, we would like to work for develop further the project uh, towards a non-custodial approach by leveraging on Filecoin smart contracts. So having a, like a fully decentralized uh, application. Uh, 
any other like UX or like major changes that you foresee or is that kind of like sure yeah like after um, that you're, you're sort of in, in place sure i forgot to mention that we we would like to work also on uh, the wallet filecoin wallet to create like a metamask for filecoin so to wrap um the code into a plugin for chrome to easily access filecoin testnet and uh mainnet as well <laughs> this ui wallet was very like initial approach for for testing the the wrapping and unwrapping but our intention also is like a separate those things for for the wrap and unwrap interface yeah the, i think the the question main question i had was around the, the custodial part of it it seems like uh like as far as i understand the filecoin smart contracts are a little ways off uh getting you know this is a, a great way to kind of demonstrate what the potential power is until then um, can you talk a little bit about what the hard, challenging part uh, was from a smart contract development standpoint? From the smart, uh, what, what you mean, like uh, Ethereum or uh, in general? Yeah, like the UI seems pretty. The UI seems pretty like easy to follow, wrap, unwrap. What, yeah, I guess so it's maybe from, my question is what, 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 what was the hard part, and where's and where's sure. the danger? Sure. The the hard part. I just uh, will just intro. The hard part would, would, uh, was like uh, to check for transaction on, on Filecoin. So we were uh, first using uh, Textile PowerGate API. We couldn't find a way to uh, watch for uh, transaction. And then we, we used a Lotus node to do that. So if you... Yes, once we get to, to, to use a Lotus node and actually read the transactions, we figured out how we can like actually listen for a, a given exact transaction between two address then uh, like get the message and, and and see the details of that message to see the actual value that have been transferred so we can actually mint the yeah. token in, in the Ethereum network. That was the hard part because at the beginning we, was, we were like uh, using a power gate, but like there is a no, no clear way to find and read all the transactions in that sense. So we have to take the power gate for the, for the front end MPI at the wallet uh, API and use the the Lotus node to, to read the actual blockchain of Python. Cool. Yeah, um, that's really great. You guys figured out how to do that. And it's something I'd like to add to PowerGate. So I'll keep in touch with you guys and, and we'll make sure. that happen. You'll have, to, you'll have to teach me more about that. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Thanks for, for your support. Uh, was, yeah. uh, thanks a lot. Of course. Awesome. Thanks, guys, for the demo. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So uh, quick note, after this next project, we're going to take like a five minute break, uh, give the judges a chance to kind of collect their thoughts and also uh, me a chance to make some coffee. And so uh, just a heads up on that. So next team up is ShopFS. Um, they're doing an interactive IPFS Ethereum marketplace. So if you guys are ready, you can uh, share your screen and get the video going. All right. Also a quick note on these guys. The video is a bit longer than usual, so the Q&A will be a bit tighter than usual. Um, so just maybe think about the questions a bit, a bit more during the video. All right, let's go. Hello, everyone. So today we'll be presenting our submission, uh, ShopFS, a decentralized data marketplace. So here is our team. Now we'll straight move in to our introduction. Lately, we have seen the user adoption across Web3 has been phenomenal. And there has been a need to have an end-to-end -end solution which involves monetizing. And we hope that ShopFS can fill that void. And uh, lately, this is the trend that's been for the data market size. And uh, as you see from 2011, it's uh, rised linearly. So let's move into the our value proposition. Firstly, enable creators to monetize their content using decentralized technologies. Then we have a very easy to use UI UX for both parties and a subscription model on top for a better user visibility and social profiles so that you can identify the sellers and the buyers that you want to interact with. So let's move into the architecture of the DAP now. So we start off with our shop FS smart contracts, which are directly in communication with Save Layer EIP 1620 contracts to cater our subscription model needs. Then we have seller and buyer each of them running a fleet space demon instance at their end to cater to our storage needs and then ensure that the buyer has private access to the content that he buys. We have a key management service which is monitoring our smart contracts 
So this is our tech stack. We use Fleet Space Demon to store files in private buckets, and we use the Graph Protocol for querying data. We have three bots for social profiles and a, a subscription model. We use a Sabier contracts. Yeah, so we can move on to the demo. Hello guys, this is the landing page of our application. We want to make it very easy for our users. They just have to upload a file, describe it, and they can start earning fees for it. First step is to upload a file. I'm uploading a book on DAOs. So in the background, the file is being uploaded using Fleek Space Demon. File is successfully sold. Now I can go to the explore page and see all the files for sale. Then I can go to the file details page and buy the file. This involves two transactions and the file is bought. Now I can download the file. The file gets downloaded locally using Fleek Space Demon and the local file location will be put up on the display. I can see my files which I have put for sale. The files I have bought and my subscribers, I have no subscribers right now. My subscriptions if I have any. And I can update my subscription info. The minimum number of days the user must subscribe is five days and amount per day, so one die per day. So I confirm the transaction. My subscription info has been updated. Any user who subscribed to me can download any of these files without having to go through the steps of buying it before that. He can also subscribe. To subscribe, he has to amount of days he wants to subscribe to. Minimum number is five as said before. So let's say I want to subscribe for 10 days. That means I have deposited 10 die right now. So how it works is we use save layer contracts in the background. The contract will calculate how much die per second the seller must get and accordingly stream that money over the 10 day period subscription is created. If I cancel my subscription midway, the contract will automatically calculate how much money is the seller owed and how much money I must get back at that particular point of time. The seller can withdraw money from this subscription. Now I'm locked in as the seller. So I can see that this person is subscribing to me for a duration of 10 days and it started on this particular day. To withdraw, I just have to create a transaction. So we also have docs where the user can see some usage manual. For any support, we have a Discord server where users can get their queries resolved. Thanks for uh, pairing with us throughout the demo. What we plan is to have a DAO which will manage the development of the product. The DAO will also be used to curate content. We also plan to have a fee model where we can charge a small fee which will go straight into the development. Coming on to the roadmap. So currently we are here a shop FS MPP on Rinkibi and we plan to move to a decentralized key management structure. Currently we are using a centralized service for our key management and finally launch shop FS DAO and launch shop FS on mainnet uh, environment around this. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay, cool. We got four minutes for Q and A. I see it was a bit shorter than I thought. We yeah, edited it down. I, I did. I wanted to say thank you for being the first project so far that's had an architecture diagram. Uh, it really helps from being able to figure out what the different pieces are and things like that. Had a few stack lists, but uh, it's nice to be able to visually see where the flow. The uh, I'm really interested in the streaming payments part of that, um, and I haven't really seen that that before or read about it. Uh, what, how, from an implementation standpoint, does this just charge periodically? Does it come back? When you say streaming, how often are these transactions? What happens when transactions are delayed or uh, when the wallet runs out? So how it works is uh, you first, you we calculate uh, how much the total amount is, and then uh, the contract automatically divides it per second of the total, total duration. And every second, it's basically ca calculating how much so at any point when the person actually wants to withdraw, that's when the calculation happens. And then based on the number of seconds elapsed, the contract directly uh, sends the money to the person who asks for it. When you cancel it, basically whatever is remaining at that particular term, uh, time is transferred. So it's like a, almost escrowed and then and then pulled in when the the, per, the recipient chooses to withdraw? Yes. Yep. Yep. So we didn't implement that. That's that's already there by Sable. We just used it. Yeah. So you just have your funds locked in in a uh, you know in a stream for a duration where two parties agree, and uh, the recipient can withdraw you know any time during the stream or 
the complete amount after the stream ends and uh, the uh, seller or the buyer on the other hand can uh, cancel it anytime and based on the amount of du the duration that has passed you get your funds accordingly is there Thank any go ahead. Oh, i was just going to ask is there any aspect uh to this project when it comes to um data validation data provenance kind of you know uh, verifying the origin of the data and that the data you're downloading or buying is actually what you think it is. Any, any thought to that? Yeah. So yeah, what so, we plan so. is to have a DAO, which will help curate the content, which still haven't thought that too completely, but we want to have curation as uh, an important part of it. I was actually going to ask uh, about the DAO. So yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. We have a key management service as well, which is, you know, monitoring the smart contracts 24 seven and whenever a buy or a sell takes place. So the seller and the buyer signature first is verified and all the files are getting uploaded, uh, you know, uh, in an encrypted, encrypted form to fleet space demon. So uh, the files are secure and only the, uh, the buyer will have the private access once he is signature and everything is verified. So we are ensuring that. I, I did like also things through the second project that actually had a local host URL uh, instead of uh, centralized being the centralized uh, HP URL in the demo. So thanks for that. One of the questions I had was around space daemon. Is that something that's reasonable to expect for to uh, end users to install people who are buyers? Uh, yeah, so it's a tricky one. Yeah, so actually we have faced a lot of issues. Where, you know, while uh, throughout our hat, uh, there were some issues while on different OS and all that. And currently, if you see, you have to install it locally, right, to run it. But uh, we are in talks with uh, the fleet team and they are like, we are in conversation and they said that they are moving towards a remote thing, right, where you don't have to install it. So that's the only, yeah. So we are in conversation with them and once it's done, we will, you know, move on to that. Uh, uh, we just shift there, uh, basically. Yes. Yeah, we also tested uh, uh, hosting the space team on ourselves on a server. It's working, but we haven't demoed it fully. Yeah. yeah. We tried to include that option as well, so, but there was so a yeah, trade off. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have time for maybe one quick question. I guess it's a bit broad, but like, what are some of the challenge, like major challenges that you faced in building this particular type of application? Like when you when it comes to a marketplace, like I said, like a decentralized marketplace, especially, like what what were the biggest challenges from your perspective? I should mind I you keep the answer around like thirty seconds or so. I think the biggest the big challenge question. was sharing the private key like with the buyer in a decentralized fashion. Uh, we still we are we're using a centralized service right now as a, a centralized KMS to share the key. But we are yep. looking at options how we can share it in a decentralized manner. Yeah, we had planned to use three bots, but there were a lot of syncing issues uh, while you know joining the confidential thread. So yeah, cool, That's... awesome. Well, thanks so much, guys. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Bye and send some. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we're going to take a short five-minute break. Um, I prepared some slides, um, well, a slide, so I'm gonna put that up. But yeah, judges, feel free. You know, take it, take some time to like collect your thoughts. Maybe you need to take a break, whatever. Uh, we'll be back at one fifty six Eastern, so in five minutes.
Okay, we'll get started again in uh, just another 30 seconds, minute or two as the judges come back. I got my coffee. I don't know if you guys had a chance to <laughs> uh, get your own kind of snacks or anything. Yeah, I actually just got my coffee. So also, definitely needed today. Um, cool. Well, one thing know. also, um, yeah. this quick note for, for you guys, I, I know you guys already know this, but for anyone watching and maybe in the call, um, all these projects are listed on uh, hack.eathglobal.co slash hackfs slash showcase. So for those interested, want to get, see the more details, see the code, see the, the you know, a replay of the video. Uh, all that stuff is available. Uh, you just search by the team name. And right now it's pretty bare bones, the view, but uh, in the next uh, day or two, we'll be adding a few more features to that page. So it's a bit more interactive and, and easier to navigate. And uh, cool. Okay, so it looks like all of our judges are back. Just to confirm, uh, you guys are all good to go. Sweet. Um, okay, let's get the next team. Uh, Kotal. So right, the next team is Kotal. Just to confirm, Kotal Mustafa, that's that's you, right? Yes, I'm here. Sweet. So yeah, whenever you're ready, um, once you get the videos set up, I'll start my timer, and we can uh, we can keep going. I think you shared it and then unshared it. There we go. Hi everyone, this is Kotal. Kotal is cloud agnostic blockchain operator that make it easy to deploy self-managing, self-healing blockchain infrastructure on any cloud. So what is the problem we are trying to solve? The problem is most of the developers are using centralized IBFS gateway and node as a service instead of deploying their own infrastructure in production. So in Ethereum blockchain, for example, most of that traffic is flowing through in Fura. And if Infura goes down or go out of business, this dab will stop functioning. So what is the solution we are trying to build? The solution is an open source IBFS gateway and mode as a service. We are building it in cloud agnostic way, so it can run on all cloud out of the box, like AWS, Google, Cl Google Cloud Platform, Tencent Cloud, Alibaba Cloud, and OpenShift. And we are protocol agnostic. We are supporting Ethereum and IBFS, and we will continue to support other blockchain protocols. And we are also multi-client. So for, for Ethereum, for example, we support Go Ethereum, Hyperledger Beso, and Parity Ethereum, or Open Ethereum. Here are some examples of what you can do with Kotal. With Kotal, you can deploy an IBFS swarm on multiple clouds in different regions, and each IBFS node has different profiles applied and different node size. You can also create a multi-client Ethereum network that, that is deployed in multiple uh, multiple clouds in different regions and each node using different client like Go Ethereum, Hyperledger, Beso, or Parity Ethereum. This is our roadmap. Before HackFS, we have supported Ethereum 1. During HackFS, we have supported added initial support for IBFS. IBFS is one, and after HackFS, we'll continue adding more blockchain protocols like Filecoin, Ethereum 2, and adding user interface and middlewares. And this is time for a demo. So here's an example of a swarm, IBFS swarm. So we have extended Kubernetes to make Kubernetes know what is a swarm, what is Ethereum network, etc. So this is an IBFS swarm that has three nodes, node 1, node 2, and node 3. We have also forked IBFS to make Go IBFS start with pre-generated private key to get this identity. So node number one start with private key and apply two profiles, server and flat FS. Node number two apply different profile, low power and flat FS, and use different resources. Node three, node three start with different storage resources. We will go ahead and apply this swarm manifest.
Once we apply this manifest, Kotal operator will react and will create this three node swarm for us. As you can see, the swarm is up and running. We will forward the traffic from our machine to node number one. We can send an API to node number one, like what are the swarm appears, and we get the result from node number one. We can send another API, like what are the bootstrap peers, and we, we will get a list of all the bootstrap peers. And finally, we can go to the browser and open the web UI of node number one. As you can see, we can just see the status of node number one. We can see the files, see the peers, and modify the settings of node number one. And thank you for watching. Awesome, great video. Um, there you go, four minutes for Q&A. That, that, that seems super, super useful. Not that I want any of my nodes running on those specific cloud providers, but the ability to quickly change between them gives me a little bit more control in those, uh, in, in those, those market dynamics. So thanks, I think it's a fantastic idea and I know a bunch of ops that would be very interested in learning more about this. Uh, a little feedback also, thanks for making very clear value proposition at the beginning of your slides. It really helps when uh, judges are trying to figure out what you're doing and why. Um, so that's uh, positive feedback on, on that too. For, for you, what, what, was the, what was the challenging part? There's a lot of, of coordination of distributed topology here. What, what was the, the hardest part to implement? Yes, the hardest part is like I mentioned, running multiple cloud providers and uh, scheduling multiple nodes in multiple clouds and multiple cloud providers and uh, establishing the networking between them. This was the hardest part. One quick note, like I, there are a few people who I guess working on like, it, it's a very important, I think, um, problem to be solving. It seems like there's a, there's a few people working on that. Are you familiar with any others that like, like I guess maybe this is a question that, that would require some diligence on my side too, but like, are there others that are pursuing this? And, and I guess like, do you have a sense of like, and I know this is not necessarily product related, how this compares and like, um, you know, the number of providers is obviously a, a key point, but are there other major sort of architectural choices that you made that you think stand out in this context? Yeah, there's, there's lots of solution. I was there trying to achieve the same goal like DabNode, for example, but DabNode requires specialized hardware, but Kutad ha has no specialized hardware requirements. And, uh, we try to cut down the requirements or abstraction to zero abstraction. Like we, we don't need any hardware at all. We don't, we don't have any cloud provider requirements. They just require a Kubernetes cluster. You deploy Kotal operator and tell it, to, tell it what you want, like how many, how many uh, nodes you want and what is the client running on each node? What is the node side? What is the ABI you want to activate? And it will do everything for you in a self-managing, self-healing way. So if node goes down, it will, uh, run it back. For example, in Ethereum 2, if validator goes down, it will restart it back and it will make sure it's highly available and running in multiple regions. How, how critical was um, the existence of IPFS cluster in order to, to make this a useful tool? Um, I'm, I'm wondering, just kind of like thinking forward towards your Filecoin implementation, if you imagine there also needs to exist some kind of like clustering layer for Lotus or any Filecoin implementation, or maybe that exists, I don't know about it. Just before you answer that, it's about one minute left-ish, so just see where. So we haven't started the Filecoin implementation yet, so we don't know what are the challenges we might face, but uh, so far with IBFS, the implementation was, was quite easy. The documentation is very clear, and uh, it didn't take so much time for us to implement IBFS uh, orchestration. Does, does the existence of the cluster API and IPFS, is that uh, no, so what we have demoed really for what you're demo? doing? No, so what we have demoed is IBFS Swarm, IBFS Cluster. So IBFS Swarm is a, is a bunch of node connecting to each other and, uh, they, but they are, not, they are not necessarily have the same bin set. IBFS Cluster on the other hand, have the same bin set and they have the same. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks for the reminding me of the distinction there.
Yeah, so as I mentioned, the demos are in, in during HackFS, we have added IBFS Swarm, but Nikki, so what we are working on right now is IBFS cluster. Cool. Um, it's just right at the eight minute mark. So thanks, man, for the demo and, uh, and for answering any questions. Thank you. All right. So the next team has an interesting name, um, but big announcement. So uh, yeah, I'll let them I'll let them go ahead with their video and uh, an eight minutes video Q and A. Hi, I'm Brian. Hi, I'm Amy. We made a project called The Big Announcement. We're new to distributed application development and we're interested in building distributed publishing platforms. This project is a prototype designed to teach us and others the basics of app development with Web3.js and JSIPFS. In this video, we're going to give a quick demonstration of this simple project. The big announcement is designed to be the smallest distributed application possible that 1. Uses Web3.js 2. Stores data to IPFS 3. Locates data using unstoppable domains and the Ethereum name service 4. Has no centralized dependencies It is a media platform that displays a single very important message and any person in the world may replace that message by bidding more ether than paid for the previous message. That's the whole thing, pay the most, displaying a message to its universe. Let's give it a try. Okay, let me load our web page. So right now it is querying Ethereum for the message and then querying IPFS for the full contents of the message. All right, so a few seconds, it has loaded the contents of our message. And now uh, we can go edit the big announcement. And this is the slightly more complex part of the application. And what we have here is we can add a message and it shows us the current value of the big announcement. This is what the last user paid to upload a message to the big announcement. And for us to upload a message, we have to pay a slightly more value in Ethereum. So the message is in Markdown, and I'm going to add a message now. Okay, now when I submit this, what's going to happen is it will spin up a JS IPFS node, upload our message to IPFS, then it will take the content hash of that message and call our smart contract. Uh, and change the value of the content hash in our smart contract while also paying a small amount of ETH to do so. So if I click Submit, we will see some status messages as the thing does its work. And now I have to confirm with MetaMask. And now here's the part that might take some time while we wait for the Ethereum transaction to go through. Even just on the testnet. Yes, that right. We're running this on the Robston oh. testnet. Oh, yeah, that went Ooh, fast. Yes, it is a fast. Great. fast uh, so now we go back and we can visit the main page again, and we'll go through the same process of querying Ethereum for the content ID, then loading the message from IPFS. And voila! Yeah. It's a very simple publishing platform that is uh, distributed, has no back-end server dependencies, and is essentially uncensorable. Uh, pretty cool. Yeah, good. This was your first time building something in this space. So is isn't much of a product, but more of a teaching tool. We are going to polish its tiny code base such that it can be used as an example for beginner dApp developers. We're also going to blog about our experience building this project. For more about the big announcement, or to try it yourself, check out the link below. I was so convinced that was the end of the video. <laughs> but uh, no, I was, yeah, so like, I, I'm really curious what, were the major like learnings that you had going through this process? Like if that's correct, that this was your first time sort of doing this, like what, what did you learn? What did you really enjoy about it? Um, and, and of course, as we've talked about, what are the challenges you ran into? Sure, uh, great question. 
because honestly, this was an extremely frustrating experience. Uh, and we, we blogged about it. Uh, and there's, if you go to our links, you can see exactly our frustrations. Um, but at every step of the way, we found ourselves being a little bit annoyed at something or another. Uh, the initial difficulty we had was just understanding which technologies to use for our use case. And as you saw in the video, we ended up using the most basic technologies, just the bare IFS, IPFS and Web3. Like we didn't use anything fancy. And for the most part, we didn't use any of the sponsors products, sorry, except for Fleek and Unstoppable Domains. Um, as we were hacking, uh, a big problem we ran into was the documentation for these fundamental libraries like JS, IPFS, and Web3 uh, were, had gaps in them, like uh, where we had to just use our intuition to figure out what we were supposed to do between one step and the next step. Um, and I think for experienced JavaScript developers, we came in knowing some web development and some JavaScript development. Uh, a lot of people would have been able to fill in the gaps themselves. But there were a number of places where we just spent hours spinning our wheels, figuring out like what to do with some NPM instruction or something like that. Uh, and uh, the JS IPFS docs specifically, I think, were a little frustrating to us um, because there's not a lot of tutorial material and the IPFS spec is like a platform language independent markdown document that doesn't really have, it's not really connected to the JS IPFS library that we were actually using. Um, ultimately though, we do feel a lot of satisfaction that uh, we completed our MVP with all the features we intended to. So we feel like we've learned a lot. I've awesome. taken so many notes, thank you. Uh, and I wanna go read that blog post. I have a question, what's the end game? Where does the money go? Who's the final <laughs> message? Yeah, so uh, this is like not really a product. Um, it's more of an art project and a prototype and a test. Like once we get it on the main net, if people find it and start throwing money into it, awesome. Uh, that money will probably go to our pockets someday. But if like this never gets any eyeballs on it, then who cares? You know, it was a good learning experience. Um, in the end, like right now we don't have a pinning solution. Uh, we just throw it into the, the throw the message into the network and like just just pray. Um, so a real product which we may continue to work on would have some kind of distributed pinning solution. It doesn't require us to sort of like directly have a call a server API, and money I, would go to that. I, I had another question. I really love that it's a teaching tool. That's fantastic. How are you? What what is your approach to parlaying what you learned? into enabling others to be able to, to cross those hurdles and bridge those gaps in a way that uh, they can learn from your experience. Like yeah, I see that the, the UI. I'll quickly also yeah. start us with this question, maybe keep it in like 30, 45 seconds answer because we're around the end point, but go on. Great, what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep this project as small as possible. We're gonna flesh out the source code that it is so that it's beautiful as possible and well commented, handles the error cases and we have a nice, nice reading that directs you to the, all the parts of it. And then we're gonna have basically a blog post or maybe a tutorial that says like, here's how you build this thing. And then we'll post it to various interested forums. And it should be like a standalone little piece of tutorial. Awesome. Thanks guys, that was a really fun demo. Thank you. Sweet. Um, so I think we have four or five projects left. Um, and the next one is called Go Image. Uh, it's an image file management platform. So uh, whenever you're ready, uh, yeah, you share your screen and I'll, I'll start the timer. Actually, Liam, uh, we've switched order. The next project oh, okay, is sorry. Interplanetary Container. Oh, okay, sorry about that, there's a change. Okay, yeah, Interplanetary Container Registry. Um, like Docker Hub, but it's fully decentralized. All right, so yeah. My name is Yelsi Zanko, and I'm excited to introduce you to my HackFS 2020 project called Interplanetary Container Registry. The ultimate goal of the project is to build a decentralized version of Docker Hub. 
During the hackathon, I got hands-on experience with IPFS and documented a way to push Docker images to IPFS and pull images from there. I also built a simple web frontend to browse those images and their tags. Let's jump into the demo. Here you can see the list of the images published to the container registry. This list is fetched from IPFS using the JavaScript implementation of the IPFS protocol. When you click on the image, you see a short description and a list of image tags. Description and tags are also fetched from IPFS. On the right, you see command that should be run to pull the image from the registry. Let's try it out. First, I download the image from IPFS using IPFS get command. Then, I load it using Docker. And that's it. Now let's see how to push a Docker image to the registry. First, let's pull something from Docker Hub. Then, I create a directory for the image and tag. I also save a short description of the image. Finally, I save the Docker image to the tag directory. Now I publish an updated version of the container registry. After that, I have to update the registry CID on the front end. It is required only because DHT implementation in JavaScript is still incomplete and not stable, and I could not get IPFS resolve working in a browser. Awesome! Redis Docker image is now pushed to Interplanetary Container Registry. So under the hood, the Container Registry is basically a hierarchy of IPFS directories and files. The registry name you saw during the demo, containers.zanko.dev, is published using IPNS and DNS link. The web frontend is built using the JavaScript implementation of the IPFS product. As future work, I want to build a tool called IPCR. This tool will manage container registries and will allow to push and pull Docker images easily and effectively. I also realized that it's not necessary to have a dedicated web application to browse the container registry. Instead, the IPCR command can render a static website that represents the registry and its contents every time you push an image. That website should be also published to IPFS. It would be also cool to support .crypto domains for registry URLs. You can check the live demo on Flick as well as at elsa.danko.crypto. I learned a lot and had fun working on this project. Thank you so much for this opportunity. That was cool. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Can you? Uh, oh, one of the questions I had was was, uh, was something we asked in a pre in previous one about data provenance and trust. Uh, what are your thoughts on a on a trust model for pulling down images? Uh, yeah, I think uh, so. I used uh, DNS link and IPNS to publish my container registry, so it's. Uh, it's uh, effectively tied to my DNS that I own. But uh, to move it further, I think we can use also unstoppable domains and uh, to also uh, publish uh, container registry names there and resolve them using the IPCR tool. Uh, I just wanted to clarify the the command line tool you talked about building in your next steps yeah that would, that would kind of replace the need to use um like the ipfs command line directly yeah sure I okay yeah cool so uh, my goal was to figure out the simplest way to put uh, images and their metadata to ipfs and uh, without building anything on top uh, by just using existing tools. And then uh, from that, I can go and build uh, the dedicated tool on top of Docker API and uh, either IPFS slide, I mean embedded uh, version of IPFS or using the IPFS node to run on local machine. You have any uh, thoughts or concerns about uh, 
like was mentioned in the last presentation, pinning the data on IPFS? Are you doing that yet? Or I kind of see some really cool opportunities for actual hosts that are downloading images to also pin them to make them available. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, that's a cool idea. I think, uh, yeah, should be good. Cool. In doses. We have another um, minute and a half or so. Do you have anyone else have any last questions? Uh, it, it's interesting because there's a there's like a, a private registry space kind of here, and the opportunity for public registry space, but there's not really yet coordination around that global registry space. Have you thought about ideas for that? Yeah, initially I was was thinking about like a global registry space. But then I realized to make this thing fully decentralized, uh, uh, it would be really great to just let individuals and organizations create their registries and publish them. And uh, one good thing about uh, build, uh, about uh, pushing a static website instead of just having the web application is that we already have search in the search engines that are working with IPFS and I hope those static websites will be discovered by these search engines and people can find can actually find docker images that are on IPFS. I, I love that little detail too I think that that would be that's great that also that gives that static page gives you kind of a, a vector to be able to do that coordination and communication without having to be right. centralized right pretty neat. Yeah, prob probably we can also use maybe textile the DB or orbit the way to further track downloads or maybe stars or something. Cool. Um, any last comments or? Okay, cool. Thanks so much, man. Thank you. All right, so um, we have two projects left, Pygate, Padlock, and um, if we can get GoImage back, we'll have them. But uh, up next is Pygate. And uh, Pygate's building a Python interface and tools for Filecoin uh, using Textile. So um, yeah, without further ado, I'll let you take it away. This is Pygate, a Python interface and tooling for the Filecoin network. It's built with PowerGate, gRPC, and Flask, for the HackFS hackathon. The PyGate project team has two goals. The first goal is to bring PowerGate into the Python community. This is a February 2020 survey of over 65,000 developers and Python is overwhelmingly in focus. Given these vast possibilities, our team reasoned that there would be an acute need for tooling which will expose PowerGate and Filecoin to the enormous and influential Python developer community. Data science, machine learning, web applications, and many other innovative software tools rely on the flexibility and consistency of Python to help them solve problems for people around the world. Currently, there exist only JavaScript and Go libraries, which are able to interact with PowerGate to leverage these new opportunities for content utilization. Our second goal is to create tools upon which to build applications and experiences. PyGate provides these developers a set of tools to effectively build their next project solving big problems on top of the Filecoin ecosystem. In order to achieve these goals, we created three products. The first is the PyGate gRPC interface, a Python library for PowerGate. The second is the PyGate web app, a Flask reference client for PowerGate and Filecoin. And the third is the PyGate API, a Flask asynchronous HTTP and WebSocket API for web applications. Building on the gRPC definitions provided by the textile team, this library allows for Python to drop in support for Filecoin to any Python software. We're happy to be able to provide this to the community. It has near feature parity with the PowerGate interface. It's actively powering the PyGate reference client. It has developer quick starts and several examples. And the best part is it's available on PIP right now. The PyGate gRPC package makes the endpoints of the PowerGate API to the Filecoin network available as Python methods. These are being used in the PyGate web app to demonstrate basic PowerGate functionality in a Python Flask application. Users can upload 
single files to the Filecoin network via the PowerGate API. They can also upload batches of files. Or they can select a batch of files and choose to upload it as a tarball package. Users can search for already uploaded files and retrieve them from the network. All the deal negotiations handled in the background. PowerGate uses the Filecoin file system concept. Users can add new FFSs and make them the default. They have the ability to change configuration settings and push them to already uploaded files using that, those configuration settings. Users can track wallet balances. A new one is created for each FFS. And they can also review a log of all PyGate web app transactions and error reports. In addition, we'd love to discuss more about our learnings, feedback to the protocol labs and the textile teams, our team, and the next steps for PyGate. Thank you. OK. Um, as somebody who uh, com comes from a background in DevRel, I, I, I don't care about what language is some developer's favorite. I care about total addressable market. So, and I've really been missing Python stuff in this world. So very excited. Thanks for tackling this challenge. Uh, also, it seems like a really a lot of uh, uh, care towards idiomatic Pythonness and, and developer tools and the, just the overall DX uh, seems really nice. Like you put a lot of thought into it. So uh, kudos for that. Also, uh, one of the questions I had was around like what are the what are the what is the missing piece? Uh, like, is it is this a I'm not I'm not a Python community person at all. Like, what do you think the biggest challenge is from bringing uh, tools like these and platforms like these into Python? Right. So um, essentially, you know, we have a few next steps, um, and what we're looking to do is to include this as part of the textile offering, right? So that textile is able to either help us or um, manage the, the custody of, of this uh, library. Um, and generally speaking, that's one of the, the major points for any software project is to have uh, reliable documentation and to ensure that, that it's uh, sustainable going forward. So I'd, probably, I'd say that's probably one of the biggest uh, aspects of that. Yeah, very cool. I think we solved you... one of the major problems for Python developers. Oh, can, sorry, can you hear me? I, I think one of the major problems we solved for Python developers is that they don't have to deal with protobuf messages at all. That's all abstracted away in that gRPC client. So if, as the, as the one that was working on the web app reference client, I could just, I'm, I'm just dealing with Python dictionaries. I don't have to deal with any of that. So we've solved a major kind of hurdle there already. And that's, you know, that's our major contribution. Um, and as far as other pieces, like, you know, the, the reference app is there. It's for the people to build off of. Flask is the most popular uh, uh, mini web framework out there in the Python community. It's got, you know, thousands and thousands of developers. So it speaks to them already. And, um, but, and we've started work on this uh, web API um, to solve the issue of long running tasks against PowerGate and Filecoin deals, um, which is also going to be a major, um, I think, uh, boost for uh, Python developers looking to implement on top of Filecoin. Is there, um, well, I guess first, let me just say like, thank you for doing this work. I mean, um, on the textile side of things, we are, this is exactly the kind of thing we love to see happen with a, a project. And, you know, moving forward, we definitely want to get uh, feedback from you guys about how we can keep this development going and make it as smooth as possible. Um, yeah, yeah, so thank you for that. Um, one question, I'm just curious, uh, 
is there like a, a in the web application? Is there a, like a, a JavaScript client or something that's communicating with the Flask backend, or how are, how are all those interactions happening in the communication between the the front end and the back end? I'm not familiar with Python web development much, so there was there's a bit of um, jQuery in the client, just a little bit for some of the stuff you saw in the demo, um, like just for like the upload button and a little bit like, but for the most part, that's in Flask. It uses Jinja templating. It's Jinja is very popular in the Python world as well. It's used in Django uh -huh. as well. So Flask has templating built in. Um, and so that's all being handled by Flask templates. It's like, it's a, it's a web framework in that sense. Like it handles, it gives you the, all the tools to do, to do web template, templating. And then you yeah. can add your own JavaScript on top, whether that's plain vanilla JavaScript or most commonly it's some kind of jQuery and we use a little bit of that. Um, and, and Bootstrap. So Bootstrap is just the, the basic, you know, for, for the CSS layout, we use Bootstrap there. So that combination is very common in the Flask world. One other thing also and, is But that... all the rest of it is... Sorry, go for it. Sorry, all the rest of it is just, is just uh, Python methods in the, in the Flask routing, um, routing scripts that are then talking to PowerGate via that gRPC library. So the gRPC library is used throughout. Every time it's making a call and going, all that file upload and download is all using PowerGate and it's for the, for the deals and the, the checking the wallets um, and changing that config is actually pushing it through, um, uh, through PowerGate, um, doing that, that config push. Um, that's all happening through the gRPC client uh, uh, scripts that we are now, I can just use plain uh, Python to do that with. Um, we only have a couple of seconds left, but I know Art, you had a comment, so I'll let you make your comment and then we'll wrap up. Sure, yeah, thanks, no problem. It, basically, it's just that, yeah, we do have to use some JavaScript, uh, especially when we're working with the API, um, using the sockets. Uh, but yeah, like uh, Peter was saying, uh, a lot of the heavy lifting is done by the, the interface to PowerGate um, and, and through the Python library. Cool, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, it was a cool demo, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, next up, I believe, is Padlock. Um, and there are already calls, a lot of you guys. Um, so, yeah, I'll let, I'll let you take it away. Okay, sure. I'm just sharing my screen. Hi everyone, this is Padlock. Secured by Secret Network enables monetization for content creators on the decentralized web. It is a tool for a variety of use cases like digital rights management, access control, and key management. In this video, we will demonstrate how privacy preserving secret contracts enable unique capabilities with programmable privacy. So to begin in this hack, we asked ourselves, how can we monetize content on the decentralized web in a trustless way? Because as a content creator, if I have content on IPFS, the only way I can monetize it is by encrypting it. Say I promise you as my consumer, if you pay me 10 DAI, I'll share my decryption key to my content with you. But this can't be done on an Ethereum contract because the decryption key, state of the contract, will be public. So how can we program sharing the decryption key with privacy after payment? With secret contracts, we can, because we can store the decryption key as the contract state. So how does this work? The idea is to use secret keys, which are stored in a privacy-preserving secret contract allowing users to manage or program access control by selling private keys that unlock their encrypted content. Using the privacy preserving features of secret network and the decentralization of IPFS on Filecoin, there is an opportunity here to create new capabilities without middlemen on Web 2.0 content platforms. Our demo will now go into how one piece of content can be uploaded and sold to one user at one time. Here's how that will play out. As a creator, I can go to the app using Fleek for hosting the web app, get an auto-generated secret address anonymously, or create a public profile using Threebox for managing profiles, secret keys, and secret network credentials. Upload new content on IPFS and Filecoin, leveraging Textile's PowerGate for IPFS hosting, the graph for indexing, add metadata for the content, 
and have that metadata stored and pinned on IPFS by using Pinata set price for the content. Ethereum is used as the payment and data layer, keeping a log of all creations and buy orders. MetaMask for Ethereum wallet use. The content would be encrypted by a secret network, public and private key pair, fetched from the app's secret vault contract. Lastly, we added an unstoppable domain for the project. As a buyer, I can see a preview of the content in the browse page, pay in crypto, receive the non-fungible token in my Ethereum wallet to access keys on secret network. There's also the Oracle watching purchases and whitelisting buyers on the padlock secret contract. Currently, we are exploring various various integrations with existing media platforms and publishers. Although we built a web app for this demo, our hope is that Padlock will function as a widget built into those applications. Overall, we are thrilled to release this example of a secret app running on secret network, interoperating with Ethereum. And we are excited to continue working on this project. Hopefully, this will empower content creators to realize their potential on the decentralized web. Awesome. I really like this. Um, I'm curious, in terms of integrations with individual platforms, how are you approaching that? And are there challenges with like individual types of platforms in terms of those integrations? Um, I guess I'm also curious about how the widget will compare to the, uh, the web app. So yeah. basically, oh, sorry, uh, go ahead. OK. Uh, basically, right now, we have a, a simple smart contract on Ethereum, which provides a receipt in the form of a non-fungible token. But you could imagine other non-fungible tokens being used as the, the purchase. So when you buy a, a non-fungible token, that would unlock the encrypted content. And, and so other platforms, uh, such as you know, the, the art tokenization platforms like Super Rare, Known Origin, Maker's Place, et cetera, or you know, music streaming platforms like Audius, um, even virtual reality platforms like CryptoVoxels. You can imagine a similar applicability for any of those because of the, the you know, flexibility and generalization of the secret contract we've implemented. Got it. And then as a follow up, can you talk a bit about that contract and, and how secret works in that, in that regard? Yeah, so it's it's a simple way to store and manage private keys in a contract. So the keys are generated using your secret network account, which is a, a separate key pair, um, and it you know enables those keys to be managed in a trustless way, um, which you can't do in a contract on Ethereum because it's public. Essentially, they have encrypted inputs outputs and state relying on trusted execution environments uh, within our nodes across the secret network. I can go into more detail. But. Awesome, no, I'll, I'll stop there and let others ask some questions. Uh, yeah, th thanks for the demo, the really, really nice video and the, the design of the, of the site is really nice as well. I, I also was super interested in learning more about the, the secret network. Uh, this is definitely from a feedback perspective, this is something that would a visual, I think, of the overall architecture would would really help tell this story a little better. There's a lot of moving pieces, and also seems there's some clever pieces in there that I would love to learn more about. Um, but there's there's not really a lot of time here. So, uh, but but kudos on on trying to solve a, a really difficult problem uh, that I think a lot of content creators and and content platforms are going to hit. Yeah, that's great feedback. We have about a minute left, so there's no. I I do have a question uh, from a you know, well where where does this keep going? It's just keys all the way down, right? Keys to unlock keys to unlock keys, and and from a from a from your learnings in this project, 
how have you thought about either like a, a, a pattern or protocol or approaching like a, or publishing some type of standard to get, um, I guess, more adoption of this approach with regards to uh, access control and decentralized key management? Not in depth, I haven't, um, but yeah, the idea is, the idea is, has been there, but uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. You know. Yeah, so um, actually we, we uh, like all the uh, decryption stuff was kind of last minute. So we, we had uh, kind of a problem with the decrypting data uh, just due to encoding. Okay, so uh, if you see uh, the last few seconds of the video, uh, the output text file was kind of, you know, had unescaped characters and things like that. You know, that's why we had to test with the text file. It's, it was easier, you know a lot more tolerant to that kind of change. You know, with the, an, an image file, you just get an, a broken image. Uh, so we just need to like do a lot of testing and uh, come up with the uh, appropriate solution for the encoding issue. Um, you know, other than that, building a, an open platform using textile tools. Uh, so I think uh, we had a lot of challenges there. And, uh, you know, textile tools are awesome when you're building something like private spaces. Like for example, if you're building a, a decentralized Dropbox, uh, they would be really awesome to incorporate. But the problem we had here is building a platform where you could share uh, one single IP, um, one single FFS instance with many users. Okay, so then it becomes problematic because you, the, anyone anyone would, would be able to like push new CID configs, and you know just ruin the platform for anyone else. So there's an issue here. You know just uh, I think it relates to textile coming up with like more complex ACL types to support that kind of uh, complex interaction with multiple tiers of uh, access. But yeah, I think, think this is like, yeah, there's a lot of in like room for uh, growth here and, you know, becoming, uh, you know, a much more um, like a fully fledged product. Yeah. If, if this is something you guys continue working on, definitely uh, get in touch yeah. with us because it sounds like um, the problems you have are things that we are also trying to solve. So definitely mm -hmm. be collaborating on that. So good work. Awesome. Thanks, great. Yeah, we'll so, sorry, uh, I read about uh, textile uh, coming up with like more complex ICL types, and there's a right way for, for that for a thread DB, I think. So it would be um, very cool if you just get a heads up on that. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for the demo, guys. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. OK, so um, I guess actually with that, um, the one team that uh, wasn't able to make it before to go image, we're done for the day. So. Um, yeah, thanks so much, guys, for taking all the time to judge all these projects. Thanks to all the participants and you that are still on the call watching also um, or watching the recording. This has been a lot of fun. Um, we are doing these all week as we judge all of the, I don't know what the total count is now, but uh, quite a large number of HackFS projects. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.